Hi guys, Olive here, here today to do a dual nonfiction review of the two books that I read for the Sport Challenge for Nonfiction November 2019. Though I picked up both of these books for their very loose connection to the word sport, they ended up overlapping in really interesting ways, so I thought I would talk about both of them in one video. So let's start off by talking about the book I picked up first called So We Read On, The Great Gatsby and Why It Endures by Maureen Corrigan. This was a 2014 release, and as you probably expected, it is all about the 1925 American classic The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now there are a million Fitzgerald biographies, and conversations about this book within the book world are frequent, but what makes this book a little bit different is that it looks not just at the book and its history and its themes, but also at the magnetism the book still has even with modern audiences. Although the man still fascinates readers today, and although he had some wonderful qualities, he was not very well liked in his day. At his very worst, he definitely was an alcoholic. He could be very controlling. And he was, it seems, very susceptible to what others thought of him. I think a lot of people saw him as weak because of that. And then when it came to his writing, Europeans thought he was too American, and conservative Americans thought he was a no-good booze hound who represented everything wrong with the 1920s. Despite all of that, Fitzgerald had some really high hopes for this, his third novel, which, as you likely know, is all about a man who reinvents himself, earning a fortune, by participating in some unsavory activities in order to win back a girl who had rejected him years prior, mainly because she was rich while he was poor. The final novel that he came up with was a beautiful, meticulously crafted, jazzy critique of the type of high society lifestyle that he and his wife Zelda led during the Roaring Twenties. It really lays bare some of the misconceptions that Americans are told about what is possible for our lives. We as Americans are told that the sky's the limit, that we can achieve anything that we could possibly dream up when the realities of life often disagree. As Maureen Corrigan says in the introduction, given what happens to its main character, Gatsby hardly qualifies as an upbeat read. Then again, taken together, many of the candidates for our great American novels, Moby Dick, Invisible Man, The Scarlet Letter, Huckleberry Finn, To Kill a Mockingbird, Beloved, constitute a general chorus of restlessness and disappointment, to put it mildly. These books fly directly into the sunny face of that vaunted American optimism. In many ways, they are all un-American. Maybe Gatsby's ending desolation comes as more of a shock because the first movements of the novel, after Nick's retrospective introduction, are awash with the bubbly optimism of the Roaring Twenties. But the party ends, and the lights go out. In Gatsby world, as opposed to Disney world, America is exhausted before it ever got going. It's all over, Nick decrees on the very last page of the novel, but he does so in the most beautiful sentences ever written about America. Gatsby's fall from grace may be grim, but the language of the novel is buoyant. Fitzgerald's plot may suggest that the American dream is a mirage, but his words make the dream irresistible. Gatsby certainly isn't an upbeat novel. Like in my favorite TV show, The Wire, which this book actually discusses because The Great Gatsby is at the center of a discussion in one scene of the show, it showcases the futile efforts to move between classes. After reinventing himself, Gatsby may have had the money, but it's made pretty clear to him by just about everyone that regardless of how much money he has, he will still always be a nobody from nowhere. In this world, breeding matters. And realistically, that's the way America is as well, whether we'd like to admit it or not. And as Gatsby finds out after chasing a dream for so long, when you finally get it, you realize it was almost better in your head. I've always thought that was a statement of how the American dream is never really achieved because it's never going to meet your expectations. And after you get it, there's always going to be just that one more thing that you want. It's inexhaustible. The author of this book is a scholar who specializes in a few different literary subjects, obviously one of those being F. Scott Fitzgerald. She's also a book critic on NPR's Fresh Air, but for the purposes of this video, she is also an unabashed lover of The Great Gatsby. I never studied literature in school, but reading this book made me feel like I got a chance to slip into one of those really cool classes that us super nerds would fight for a chance to get into, only to inevitably end up waitlisted. She talks about about how this book is so timeless in its themes and yet is so locked in time since it is such a product of the 1920s. And she also draws attention to the really powerful themes of drowning, of color, of time. She also points out how deliberate this book is. Every little detail is so thought through, oftentimes excessively so, 
but at the end of the day, isn't this a book about excess? The Great Gatsby got a few decent reviews after its release, but it got a slew of negative ones, and overall it was a financial flop. And when I read that, I couldn't help but see it as a similar situation to when John Singer Sargent revealed the portrait of Madame X at the 1884 Paris Salon. Could it be that the Americans of the 1920s, when they read this novel, saw a damning portrait of themselves and not caring for the reflection, rejected it. I think it's a really interesting thought experiment to think if this book would have been better received if it was published in the following decade. Regardless, the book went on to lead a whole second life after Fitzgerald's death, and this is a topic of interest for Maureen Corrigan. She really tries to pin down what was the precise moment when people started to recognize the genius of this book. How did it go from a badly received book to being on nearly every high school reading list across the country? I encourage you to pick up this book and go on that journey with her yourself. She will spoil The Great Gatsby if you've not read it already, obviously. But I do think this book would be a wonderful follow-up after a first reading or a great companion for a much needed reread. I had so many ideas from So We Read On and from The Great Gatsby still on my mind when I picked up this next book, my second pick for the sport challenge. That was Kicks, The Great American Story of Sneakers by Nicholas Smith. This is a history of the athletic shoe, commonly known as the tennis shoe or sneaker. It talks about what footwear was prior to the invention of the sneaker. It talks about how they developed alongside several different sports and ultimately how they evolved beyond athletics into the fashion industry. Right off the bat, the book starts off by talking about the man who invented the process of stabilizing rubber, because you may not know this, in its natural state, rubber really can't be used in things. It melts in the heat, it turns brittle in the cold. Only through the process of vulcanization, as it is known, can it be used in the myriad of products we see it in today. But inventing it was an ordeal. Charles Goodyear was an American man who doggedly dedicated himself to finding the perfect recipe to be able to stabilize rubber. And although he eventually got there, it caused him complete financial ruin several times over. If that's not a potent symbol of the determination of Americans, I don't know what is. But once the vulcanization process was out there, sneakers could live long and prosper. As the book starts going into the footwear industry, it starts talking about some of the big name companies that we still see around today. And I was honestly very surprised to see what an early start some of these companies had, albeit sometimes under different names. And speaking of names, the book drops some names that you would absolutely expect to be included in a book about sneakers. You have Chuck Taylor, Michael Jordan, Run DMC, Kanye West. If you know any of these names, you might be able to guess that this book talks about how sneakers trans transition from being something that you could use to improve your game on the courts to something that could be used as a fashion accessory. Beginning with their affiliation with the hip hop scene in the 1970s, wearing them became an art and a statement of who you were. Brand loyalty really took hold. So your choice of sneakers and even how you wore them down to the laces meant something. As sneakers became ingrained in many different aspects of our lives, so in sports and recreation, of course, but also in pop culture, music, and fashion, Sneaker collecting also became a hobby. People would compete with each other trying to find the rarest pairs, and when shoe companies caught wind of this, they started releasing limited runs of specialty shoes, knowing that collectors would covet those. Overall, this is a story of determination, reinvention, and style, and ultimately it's representative of the fleeting nature of the American ideal. True of sneakers, true also of The Great Gatsby. The biggest crossover that I noticed between these two books was definitely the concept of status and how we as Americans love to turn to physical objects to represent who we are as people. Jay Gatsby has a big house and a big library full of books that are uncut and therefore unread in order to broadcast an image of himself out into the world as an educated man and as someone who can afford a library like that. And the kids of the 90s wore Air Jordans not because they were a particularly attractive pair of shoes, but because they were an extension of someone that these kids wanted to be. And also because everyone knew what the number on the price tag was. At the end of the day, I thought both of these books spoke to the way that we as Americans like to wield status symbols and how that can never be divorced from materialism. Both of these books show the very best, but also the very worst of us. They show our hard work and determination to achieve things, but they also show our poisonous competitive streak and our delusions of how grandeur is simply one purchase away.
But of course, I'd love to now hear from you. Have you read either or both of these books? What did you think of them? Or if you have any comments or questions about anything I've talked about in this video or anything in general, all of that can go in the comment section below. But if you'd prefer to find me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my profiles are in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.